Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, adapted from the novelization by J.R. Millward, based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield, with J.R. Millward and Adam Coover, with music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Episode 11. I kicked the door shut, finally allowing myself to breathe freely. For all that it had revealed, the encounter had left a greasy taint on my nerves. My instincts had proved correct. Bouchard was a thug, a clever, dangerous man, but ultimately just a tool to be used at the whim of someone with far greater subtlety. Bouchard's loyalty to his men was all the leverage Eckhart had needed to make him do absolutely anything. I could now understand how far Eckhart's influence had extended. His monstrum alter ego had obviously added all of the necessary persuasiveness to negotiations. Oh, Werner, why did you have to go and get mixed up with this scum? Well, Maggie, the sooner we find that engraving and the painting, the sooner we can put an end to Eckhart's plans. And the sooner we can make that monster pay for his crimes. No need to be coy with me, Lara. I know what you really want. Don't worry. All of your dark side of the force impulses are safe with me. Very reassuring. Now, where to start? It was a fair question. I'd entered what was unmistakably Vasily's famous gallery. The grand entrance hall that also functioned as an exhibition venue, sale room and a boastful reminder that even walking through the front door would take a juicy bite from your checkbook. The ballroom-like chamber soared over three stories high and could have played host to half a hundred browsing millionaires and their attendants. Its architecture practically dripped with Art Nouveau opulence, from the curling wrought iron balustrades and staircase to the balletic marble figures embracing the bookshelves on the mezzanine floor. Exquisite vases and oil paintings stood on plinths or rested against easels, tastefully chosen to convey quality over quantity. The parquet floor was so highly polished I could see my reflection, except for the room's centre, where a twelve-foot diameter circle of enamelled tiles portrayed scenes of country life with astonishing artistry. A band of ebony surrounded this extraordinary display and was studded along its circumference with gilded Roman numerals, like the face of a magnificent, if handless, clock face. It was an eerie reminder of another decorated floor I'd seen recently, and set me thinking. I checked all of the obvious places. The bookcases, the desk with its antique brass cash register, the kind that has a drawer that bursts out like a gunshot, even inside the many vases on display. Nothing. My feet carried me up the staircase along the balcony and past the magnificent stained-glass window that took up almost the entire frontage of the building. There was scaffolding up here, with dust sheets hung to protect the fragile books on the shelves. The scaffolding's purpose was opaque to me, though I did pause to consider the mural across the back wall. Two black-robed, scholarly men were painted standing below a Christ-like figure reaching towards the heavens. To my surprise, the heavens he was reaching into was actually the figure of a woman. In one hand she held a bird of prey, and in the other, a spiked circlet. Surely not. I squinted, incredulous. 
That couldn't be the same device the stranger had used to nearly decapitate me at the Louvre. Could it? Abruptly, frustration rose in me like magma until I felt like exploding with the pressure of a thousand unanswered riddles. Ever since Werner had died, questions had assaulted me without reprieve. Who was my stalker? And what was the truth behind his mysterious crystal shard? Why did he leave it behind? How could I find and defeat Eckhart before it was too late? If I was Vasily, where the hell would I have hidden that bloody engraving? Damn it! I want answers! I swerved, lashing out at the scaffolding, dislodging a tight coil of rope. A counterweight the size of my head crashed onto the balcony and the pulleys shrieked in protest as the rope whipped round like a striking snake. A circular pane of glass in the very centre of the window tilted alarmingly in its frame. Just as I was sure it would shatter on top of me, it stopped. A cold wind howled through the gap. Snowflakes wafted in like curious moths, melting where they settled on my face. A tiny flutter of curiosity led me to wander directly beneath the window. My investigative instincts tingled in the way that always meant I was on the brink of something. The minuscule compass on my car key's fob chain told me that the window was facing due east. Inexorably, I turned and looked over the balcony. In my mind's eye, I pictured the room as it would be at the break of dawn, as the first rays of the sun rose and pierced the perfect circle in the window. The sunlight would strike the floor, right onto the elaborate mosaic, onto the Roman numeral three. It seemed to wink at me, tantalising. And suddenly I knew where the last engraving had to be. I flew downstairs, unable to rein back my natural caution. On closer examination, the floor appeared to be seamless. Nevertheless, I knew this was the right track. With fresh objectivity, my gaze swept the room, looking for any references to threes. Hitting three on the cash register proved fruitless, and there wasn't any kind of object in the room that appeared three times. Even the hands of the handsome grandfather clock behind the desk pointed to midnight, not three. Wait. Midnight? My watch said half past seven. You know, sometimes you're too smart for your own good. I spun the clock's hands round to the three o'clock position. There was a barely perceptible click, and with a soft sound, the tiled floor behind me collapsed in a smooth descent, forming a spiral staircase. At the bottom was Vasily's real office. James Bond, eat your heart out. My feet sank into a crimson carpet, my eyes adjusting to the muted light from four cabinets in the room's centre. A walnut desk and leather swivel chair waited patiently by the far wall, supporting a computer that looked like it had been built by NASA. Shelves within easy reach displayed an array of bottles and decanters that any enophile would sell their soul to possess. I knew that back room was too dull for Vasily's tastes. I paused by one of the cabinets to admire an alabaster statue, Nephilim figurine, circa 1350 BC, Cappadocia, Turkey. Come to think of it, every object and artwork in the room was a testament to a life-consuming passion for the Nephilim legend. 
There were carvings and fragile parchments in hermetically sealed cases. But there was nothing to point my way to the engraving's hiding place. A quick search of the desk proved just as disappointing. But then I'd hardly expected Vasily to keep the engraving in such an obvious place. Not when he'd taken such trouble to conceal his office. Rather frustratingly, I found a numerical keypad mounted on the wall next to a rather ominous painting. But there was no sign of a safe or secret door. Almost by accident, my eye fell on Vasily's waste paper basket. You can tell a lot about someone by examining what they throw away. Some of the most fascinating archaeological finds have been made while sifting through ancient middens and rubbish heaps, from poignant soldiers' letters at Hadrian's Wall to the charred bones of sacrificial animals. An email from Vasily to Mademoiselle Carvier lay crumpled at the bottom of the bin. Mademoiselle Carvier, please refer to shadowhistories.pr. To access restricted information, type code 31597. Well, it's got to be worth a try. Hurriedly, I tapped the code into the keypad. To my delight, the painting rolled to one side, revealing an alcove hardly bigger than a box file. The fifth obscure engraving on the original calf's vellum lay inside. Not bothering to hide my joy, I lifted it out with tentative fingers. The evocative odour reminded me of every archivist's library I'd ever worked in. <sighs> gotcha! Wouldn't you know it, the Vault of Trophies is directly beneath the Strahov. Bouchard was right. Speaking of Bouchard, shouldn't we be getting back to our little friend? I realised somewhat belatedly just how much time had passed and slipped the engraving carefully into Werner's notebook. Normally, it would be sacrilege to even think about exposing such a fragile document to the ambient air, but at least the notebook would protect the vellum for a little while longer. A spark leapt from the door handle as I reached to turn it. <sighs> Strange. Surely there can't be air conditioning running in here. I stopped dead, unable to fathom the change in the room. The chain and padlock were still there. Bouchard had vanished. I have seen dragons and Atlantean goddesses, been inside a UFO and beaten Winston at chess. Nothing, however, was quite as mind-boggling as the concept of Bouchard somehow managing to slip his 120 kilo bulk out of captivity without me hearing him. The door wasn't soundproofed. In no time, I slipped the safety catch off my pistol and double-checked the handcuffs. They held fast, although I did fancy I felt a slight greasiness where they touched his skin. Nothing so lubricating as to help him escape, unfortunately. There had been specks of his blood staining the wall where he'd leaned his forehead against it, but they too had disappeared. There was only one other way he could have gone. The corridor was deserted as I stole my way back down to the basement. The shadows crowded in, suffocating the already meagre light. Damp gleamed thickly on the walls, stinking and foul. I froze. A sound, a breath of air, a change at the subconscious level. Something made me pause behind the closed side door I'd passed earlier. Standing to one side, my gun held ready. 
I placed my hand on the handle and jerked the closet door open. Bouchard towered over me, a beer moth in stained Italian leather, with his mouth stretched open in silent rage. But before I could shoot, his whole body tipped forward and struck the ground, as stiff and lifeless as a felled tree. What the hell is going on around here? Paranoia is such a lovely feeling, guaranteed to make one feel all warm and secure. It was awkward keeping my gun at the ready in my right hand while I examined Bouchard with my left, but somehow I managed it. Even my own shadow started to look threatening until I forced my shaken nerves to the back of my mind where they belonged. That's odd. The blood's already clotted. The body's cold, and rigor mortis has already set in. He's been dead several hours, at least. How is that possible? We were just talking to him. The blood's not coming from where I hit him. There, there isn't any mark on his forehead or scalp at all. All the bloods come from this wound through his heart like he's been stabbed. <laughs> Amazing that someone could even find a heart in the first place. These facts just don't add up. He's probably not going to answer any more questions, Lara. Check his pockets. He might have keys or a phone we can use. Dead bodies, as such, don't bother me. It's those that won't stay dead that are the problem. <sighs> It was tough, trying to shift that amount of limp weight. But eventually, I managed to heave him onto his side. A search of his cavernous pockets revealed a packet of breath mints, a silk handkerchief, the usual fluff and detritus of a chronic cigar smoker, and a bristling set of keys. Sheer curiosity led me to try them out on the cellar's security door. The second to last key of the bunch was a perfect fit, and I gratefully stepped out into the bracing night air. I almost gave Luddick a heart attack. <coughs> there you are. I said half an hour. It's been nearly 40 minutes. I was worried you'd forgotten me. Small chance of that. Did you see anyone just now? Yes. Bouchard just crossed the square as I got here. He was in a real hurry. Bouchard? Bouchard's dead. I've just seen his corpse in there. Lady, I know what I saw. Are you positive? N never mind. <sighs> Did you get me the Strahov code? I told you. I'm a professional. This passcode will get you into the warehouse area. It's only a low-level pass, but at least you'll be inside the complex. I can take you from there. Have you tried this code out yourself? Me? No. The place gives me the creeps. Workers have gone missing and all kinds of spooky stuff. What goes on in there, exactly? God knows. I'd give my innards to find out, but... Well, it's way too gothic for me. Remember, if you uncover anything, give me first shot at it. Huh? Sure thing. The Strahov isn't far. Luddock unlocked the car and gallantly held the door as I climbed in. White stuffing poked through the seams in the upholstery, and the floor was littered with discarded papers and fast food bags. I wrinkled my nose, wondering if the engine would even run long enough to get us to our destination. Ice crunched under the tyres as we turned out of the square into the gathering night. We're here. I straightened in my seat as Luddick cranked the handbrake, cutting off the ignition. 
Almost immediately, snowflakes began to settle on the windscreen, but I could still make out our surroundings. Our short journey had taken us away from the grandeur of inner Prague to a strictly industrial neighbourhood. We sat in the shadow of an enormous red brick warehouse, one of a dozen or so that crowded together like giants around a campfire. All had windows only on the second storey, and armies of chimneys marched against the skyline like battlements. Occasionally, trucks and forklifts would rumble past, coughing exhaust, but no one saw us. My subconscious noted rather more razor wire and electrified fences than might be warranted for an average industrial estate. There were dark shapes positioned at strategic points that could only be CCTV cameras. The lack of graffiti or general passers-by was oddly disturbing. That one, in the middle. That's the Strahov. Impressive. Do they get many visitors? Plenty, but not all come back out. There have been deliveries arriving for weeks now. Courier vans, HGVs, you name it. They all enter there. Last week a whole convoy arrived with armed escorts. They unloaded the cargo and forced everyone inside. <laughs> I don't think the drivers were expecting that. I haven't seen them or their vehicles since. Anything else I should know? Uh, look in the glove compartment. I drew out a newspaper. Puzzled, I shook it out and saw immediately that it was an international edition. Something way out of Luddick's normal league. But I was silenced by the headline. Double Monstrum Murder in Paris. Under the wanted subheadline, my own face stared furtively out from a grainy CCTV photograph. The Louvre's signature parquet floor formed the background, along with an unconscious security guard. Luddick met my eye. Smiling gently. My mouth was dry, despite my drink. Why are you helping me? You thought I'd turn you in without getting a story. <laughs> this could be my big break. You're famous. I was framed. Von Croy was a dear friend and I would never... Lady, I believe you. Why else would I let you get in my car? I'm an excellent judge of character, and I don't think for one moment that you did that. Besides, if you did murder those people, how did you get to Prague in time to kill Vasily? Ugh, the timing's all wrong. Unless you can be in two places at once. Whatever is going on in the Strahov, it's big, and I want to be the one to uncover it. Eckhart and his gang have been spooking people for a very long time, but this could bring them down if we help each other. I've already promised you whatever juicy information I can find in there. You've got a noble cause, Ludic, but I don't see you risking your neck to go get this information yourself. It's not going to be a child's tea party, even for me. I have something that might help with that. No need to get nasty, lady. I'm on your side, remember? I got you this. It could come in handy. The Strahov is one weird place. A machine pistol? Scorpion M84A, semi-automatic. Not bad. You know your stuff. No invasion force should be without one. How much? The full story. Ah, no, I won't take money. Well, not unless you want to hang on to it afterwards. What about what I already owe you? For showing me the dossiers, driving me here? <sighs> Put it on your tab for later. I have a feeling about you, lady. Maybe it's the Strahov that should be worried. Just remember. Exclusive. 
I'll be waiting for you. Thanks, Ludic. You'd better get out of here, though. This isn't going to be a healthy place to hang around. Doubly so, if I start stirring up trouble. Go home. Make a coffee. I'll come and find you. Lady, just get going. Before I change my mind about turning you in. Snowflakes settled on my eyelashes as I looked up, taking in the fullness of my target. Set against the night sky, brooding and cloaked with snow, the Strahov had the hunched look of a predator guarding its kill. The red lion head painted on its gates bared its fangs, a clear warning to look elsewhere. Using the shadow of passing vehicles, I timed my dash across the street and down a side alley, gliding under the radar of the guards patrolling its high brick walls. Quick as a shadow, I ghosted along the wall, flattening my profile and keeping to the dark spots. It was hard. Most of the compound was bathed in stark security lights. Suddenly, I found the snow to be my ally. I found a rhythm to moving with the swirling gusts that obscured my movements from any watchful eyes. In hardly any time at all, I had circled to the rear of the building, where I found a locked fire exit half hidden behind a drift that came up to my shoulder. Before my fingers had a chance to go numb, I tapped in Ludic's passcode and gave a silent prayer of thanks when the light by the door blinked green. My tracks were already being covered by fresh snow as I slipped inside. By sheer blind luck, the security guard turned his back to me just as I stepped through the door. Utterly exposed, I shrank against the wall and ducked sideways for the cover of a nearby container. The edge of my coat whipped out of sight just as I heard his footsteps turn and close on my position. I held my breath, expecting the business end of his gun to peer around the corner and target me at point-blank range. But no. The measured tread of his boots carried on. Past my hiding place. No alarm was raised. He hadn't seen me. In total silence, I eased through the container's open door and disrobed myself of the cumbersome coat and checked my weapons by touch. Now that the pounding of my heart had eased, I could make out individual voices scattered around the warehouse. All were male and all were speaking Czech, with hollers and counter orders echoing around the room. From my earlier glimpse, I knew the interior of the warehouse was vast, at least seven stories tall. I could smell diesel and burnt plastic, and the air had a dry, acrid taste. Brick and steel contained the clanking of machinery and heavy cargo, with nothing to soften the stark echoes. The sounds formed an audio map, and I half closed my eyes to improve my concentration. A whirring sound was closing in on my location. Before I could react, a heavy thunk jolted the roof of my container, and the whole thing was suddenly rising. I threw my arms out for balance as the container began to sway, caught, no doubt, in the jaws of an overhead crane. I cursed inwardly but held my tongue. 
knowing I had not been discovered. Yet. Through the gap in the container's doors, I watched the floor drop away. My container was being hoisted over a dividing wall. Yet another layer of security that bristled with machine gun emplacements and infrared tracking sensors. I counted several bald-looking guards patrolling along its length. They all wore the same no-nonsense gear as the mercenaries in the Louvre. Swapped the Kevlar for chain mail and the rifles for crossbows, and I might have been infiltrating a medieval castle rather than a 21st century warehouse. The crane juddered to a halt. I braced against the walls, pinning my discarded coat under my foot to stop it from sliding out, betraying my presence. The operator clearly believed that the container was empty and set it down with a bone-jarring lack of concern. I felt my teeth rattle and clasped my weapons to my body, mindful not to let them bang against the walls. Moments later, I heard the crane release and move away, returning across the wall to pick up more cargo. Well, at least I was on the right side of all of that security. I slipped the safety off the scorpion. Shall we dance? The first guard, unfortunate enough to wander past the container's doors, didn't know what hit him. I caught him a ringing blow under his jawbone with a pistol stock and dragged his limp form into the container before anyone could spot him. Noiselessly, I slipped along the container's flank. I am a hunter, and everyone in this room is my prey. The mantra was an old one but one that always bolstered my confidence. It didn't take an archaeologist to know that mystical men and women had known for centuries that most magic was simply a colourful term for positive thinking. That deliberate and determined application of willpower could achieve changes that were, in a word, miraculous. As long as I believed I was the most dangerous thing out there, I would be. Certainly in the eyes of anyone careless enough to cross my path. The moment I started doubting my own abilities, the spell would be broken. And I would probably end up as a bloody smear on the concrete. Good thing you've got me along then, eh, girl? Go get them. I spotted the sweep of a gun-mounted flashlight and froze. Its owner muttered in check, his voice raised in a querying tone that made me press back into the shadows. A heartbeat later, the man came into view. He was so close, I could see a gold filling flash as his mouth opened in shock. He raised his rifle to fire, but I dealt him a swift punch right on his chin. His rifle went spinning across the floor, but against all probability, he managed to rebalance from the blow. A knife appeared in his hand and thudded into the container scant inches from where my head had been. In a split second, I twisted my fist out of his grip and elbowed his stomach. The warehouse thundered as bullets traced across the container's side and a ricochet struck the luckless guard right in the throat. I backed off, out of immediate range as he fell, gargling and spasming. Sparks flew as incoming fire ricocheted off the steel container. I was trapped. Guards would be converging, hoping to come at me from both sides. I had only seconds to act. The standard response to being threatened is to freeze or attack. Instincts don't normally waste valuable grey matter when death is only moments or inches away. Fortunately, training and experience can help. I had both. In abundance. 
My finger was already pulling the scorpion's trigger as the first man entered my field of vision. I spun, the man dropping as my shots found their target, and rolled as incoming fire whistled harmlessly overhead. My second target ducked, and the bullet burst a nearby pipe instead. Steam spewed forth, and he screamed, breaking cover just as I dispatched a third guard, trying to ambush me from behind. His eyes rolled up as he expired, his neck broken by the force of my precision strike. I had a glimpse of the scalded man stumbling, blinded and blistered, before he lost his footing and tumbled over the gantry. He bounced off the cargo container and lay thrashing on the ground, maddened and howling. The ice within me thawed just a little, and I put an end to his suffering. My head snapped round, alerted by the hiss of a radio. Not ten yards away was a roofed-over guard station. Its door was open and a man in uniform was scrambling to dial the bright red emergency telephone. The handset fell from his hand as my bullet found his heart. He slumped, dead before he even hit the floor. Calmly. I replaced the telephone receiver from where the guard had dropped it. His pockets yielded up a security pass with Mark E. Zimmerman typed above the Red Lion logo. Not a high-level pass, but one that would at least beat the now useless code Luddick had given me. <sighs> Thank you. There had been too few opportunities for compassion during the last few days and I intended to take them where I could. The alternative stirred within me as I pocketed the security card, like an adder slithering through the undergrowth. If I relaxed my vigilance, that same implacability that had just saved my life could also turn me into another monstrum. The dead guard was suddenly repulsive to me. His expression, gormless in death, made me heave under the upsurge of contempt that rose within my heart. Witless sheep, blindly following a master who delighted in torture, who was so far over the sadist horizon he couldn't see humanity on a clear day. I should kill a lot of them. Purge the Strahov from the inside out. Pathetic. Foolish. Weak. They all deserve to burn. Except for Eckhart. That would be too quick. I'd draw out his death, just like he drew out Werner's guts. Make him beg like the animal he was. With that thought, I felt the weight of the Tuareg cross against my chest, and the voice of a little girl whispered through the tide of memories. The only real monsters are the ones we create for ourselves. <sighs> what am I doing? My legs were suddenly weak, and I stumbled, leaning against the guard's workstation, unable to even look at the dead man. In horror, I realised my eyes were wet. It's this place. It's what I felt when we passed Eckhart at Wren's pawn shop. His presence is like pollution. Infecting everything that gets too close. Even the guards must feel it corrupting them. Eroding their souls a little at a time. It's enough to chew a person up and spit them back out into insanity. I bet Ackhart's staff turnover is enormous. Those who survive the longest in service to him will be the worst. No consciences, no morals of any kind and no free will to question their master. 
Eckhart knows what he's doing. He wants obedient killers, willing slaves, not soldiers. We're feeling that influence even now. <sighs> then we'd better hurry. Eckhart's not winning this fight. I've a promise to keep. With a supreme effort, I focused on Salia's gift. Squeezing it in my hand and forcing out the aura that was trying to sap the strength out of me. Now that I was fully aware of it, I could almost taste the cancerous undercurrent to the atmosphere. It crept along my skin, clinging and damp, and penetrated my body and mind like tendrils of plague-ridden smog. But it was not merely passive ambience. The aura was being directed, driven by a mind of singular willpower. Invisible, insidious, it oozed over and through the entire Strahov until even the brickwork and panes within the windows was saturated and dripping with malevolence. I didn't dare imagine what such a thing might look like to someone like Putai, who had trained her mind's eye since childhood to perceive such things. The aura grew in strength, as if sensing my resistance. I will not submit. I am Lara Croft. I will not submit. My eyes screwed tightly closed as I repeated the words in my head, like a life-saving mantra. The pendant grew warm against my skin, its heat spreading through my body and galvanizing my resolve. My tremors ceased, fortified by the cry of a desert hawk. I opened my eyes and felt them spark briefly with the black within gold gaze of a sun god. Courage. Helplessly, I felt the energy sweep through me, too much for mere flesh and blood to contain. For a burning, exhilarating moment, I was something more than a mere human woman. I was the dune, the zenith sun, the beetle and the hawk. I was children's laughter and the bark of camels, the cold trickle of an oasis and the sweet nectar of scarlet-lipped flowers. I was crisp melon and the gritty tumble of pebbles, the sanctuary of a mud-brick house and the impossible vastness of the sky at night, turning with a billion stars. The hawk soared and I was every ruffle of its feathers, every twitch of its head as it scanned the ground for prey. It stooped and I was the wing bones as the effort flexed them to the point of pain, racing for the ground at over a hundred miles an hour. I was every grain of sand and every leaf of the acacia grove. The Tuareg of Putai's village lived semi-nomadic lives, and the camel trains would travel the dunes from Egypt and Libya in the east to Mauritania, Mali, and Morocco in the west. A train had clearly arrived only a few minutes beforehand, for the air was full of dust and joyful cries of men and women embracing and scolding each other in equal measure. I was the anxiety of an old woman searching the faces for her son, and the stir of desire in the pair of newlyweds who stole a kiss in the confusion of unloading camels and ferrying supplies. I was every drop of sweat on the indigo-dyed turbans and every jingle of golden anklets sparkling in the sunlight. 
I screamed without making a sound. What kind of being could survive this kind of power, if not a god? We are with you. Always. I blanched in terror. Something heavy was enclosing me. A prison that moved of its own accord. Air rushed in and out like a hurricane, in counterpart to the bird's wing flutter deep inside. My breathing. My heartbeat. Lara? Lara! I'm all right. I'm all right. The swollen flap and its flexible openings moved, altering the flow of air. Tongue. Lips. Breath. In a starburst of clarity, I was back. My fear faded, overcome by shock. The confining prison was my own flesh and blood, stuck with a single viewpoint since birth. The vision, if that's what it was, had almost made me forget the limitations of my human existence. The details faded as I tried to hang on to them, like soap bubbles that I tried to grasp in my hands. But perhaps that was only a blessing. To be everywhere, in everything, all the time. No human could withstand it. It was small wonder that prophets had a reputation for being crazy. I'm all right. I'm all right. I steadied myself against the wall. The bricks felt rough under my fingertips, but they and my fingers were separate, disconnected, just like the air filling my lungs or the concrete beneath my feet. At some level, I was still conscious of the spiritual blight infesting the Strahov, but it no longer held any sway over me. I reached my hand towards the door and felt the dank malevolence shrink back as though repelled by my presence. <laughs> I laughed, and the sound banished the last of my fears. My skin tingled as if warmed by the Saharan sun. Straightening my shoulders, I looked down at the security card still in my hand and slipped the pendant back under my shirt. If anything had a right to be afraid, it was the Strahov. In episode 11 of Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, Lara Croft, Salia, and Putai were played by J.R. Millward. Thomas Ludick and Horus were played by Adam Coover. Written and adapted by J.R. Millward. Based on an original story by A. Murty Schofield. With music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Additional sound effects courtesy of www.freesfx.co.uk, the BBC and the YouTube Audio Library. Produced by Stephen Millward. Lara Croft and Tomb Raider are the property of Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix. <laughs> <laughs>